Um, how many of you have heard me speak on this topic before? Just so a couple, good, so not too many. Um, I, I changed it up from a little bit what's on your, um, in, your, in your handout as opposed to the, the, the bad, the worse, and the despicable. I changed it to ugly, and um, you'll see why. So thank you for having me, uh, Jack and Artie. I really appreciate being able to sort of give my spin on um, drug pricing here in the United States and uh, how formularies are constructed and how that affects drug pricing. So this was the premier topic, I mean, the title, but I, I think Waiting for Godot, if any of you are familiar with Theater of the Absurd, um, this is a, a play by uh, Beckett, and I think that sort of describes a little bit more about where we're going with drug pricing. And I, I, this is a definition of Theater of the Absurd, disjointed, repetitious, meaningless, purposeless, confusing situations, lack of logical development, and I think human struggle in a senseless world and hope deferred. These are all things that I think come to mind when we try to figure out how are drugs priced, why are the highest priced drugs sometimes on the formulary, and it can just feel like theater of the absurd. So waiting for Godot. I have two disclosures, not really relevant to this discussion, but I thought I'd put them up there anyway. A lot of times when I give this talk, people think that I'm carrying water for pharma because I'm, I'm sharing the blame for drug pricing and not blaming it all on the pharmaceutical manufacturers. We all know that we love to hate uh, pharma and they're blamed certainly in the media for all of the problems related to drug pricing. And yes, they do price the drugs. And uh, you know, this is just a, a small example of the type of cartoons that are out there. And I'm, I'm, I'm behind that. They need to bring their prices down. But I think we need to have a, a bigger picture of why drug pricing is like it is, particularly in the United States. So let's start with the bad, particularly with pharma. Um, we raised the price of, it was Daraprin, they were talking about 1,700 to 75,000 a bottle. Um, should be a very handsome investment for all of us. And I think we can all agree that this is very bad behavior. But I think also, the fact that he spent $2 million on a one-of-a-kind Wu-Tang Clan album, I think we have to kind of throw that in as well, because, yeah, no. Now, the ugly. Now, I don't mean that Martin Schrelke is, is, is ugly. How many of y'all know what um, <laughs> that, that, that rodent next to it? Now, if you're from Louisiana, you can't answer. Um, but the orange teeth, uh, I, I had to throw that in because I'm from New Orleans and we do have a problem with nutria and that's a, a, a nutria with the orange teeth. So I'm not really talking about his physical looks. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up in New Orleans, in the South, and there was a saying that's that God don't like ugly. And that's the kind of ugly that I'm talking about. It's more a behavior pattern, it's your ethics, and I, I don't think that he uh, really, I think, I think God don't like him. So. There's some, a few other things that I think are ugly in terms of the drug pricing, and, and right now I'm kind of picking on pharma, but you'll see I'll sort of pivot to another aspect of the drug supply system in just a minute. Um, in 2003, there are two widely used self-injectables for, uh, for rheumatoid arthritis were priced at around 1000 a month. And um, those same self-injectables, you know, we don't really have a good idea of what the list price is. We know it's over $6,000. I have a patient that works for one of the largest PBMs nationally, and uh, she helped me sort of back into the list price of one of them. And um, it can be close to $10,000 a month. So the list prices that everyone talks about is not really being meaningful because no one pays the list price, but it's meaningful to the patient, and you'll see why. Oh yes, and we can't forget about Actar gel. <sighs> Sorry about that. Um, some other things that may be considered ugly within the, the, the drug pricing is the so-called patent thicket. And we know that there are delays in biosimilars for a particular um, uh, originator that have been put off till 2023. Um, those drug companies there have signed deals to um, delay the introduction of biosimilars. However, we do have a holdout. Uh, BI is holding out and uh, suing for wrongful patent thicket. And, you know, it has gotten the attention of Congress. And this is a bipartisan um, issue. Uh, I, I like Senator Collins' uh, idea of what 
uh, the past, uh, I'll give you her quote, the past century could be termed the age of miracle drugs, and that's true. We do have drugs that are miraculous in terms of helping our patients. Today, however, we might define a miracle drug as one that has not doubled in price since, their, since your last refill. So because of that thought process, uh, we have bipartisan support for trying to figure out a way to break through the patent thicket. I'm going a little bit fast because I was asked to, to leave um, some time at the end for questions. Okay, so now we're moving on to the despicable. And in terms of um, pharma, I don't know how many of you have read about, within the last few months, this generic drug cartel. I mean, it really, if you look into what the investigations have shown, and these are some of the biggest generic um, drug makers. I'm not going to say their names, um, but it started off as two, and now it's moved to about 16 companies. And it really is something out of the godfather. The heads of these companies, they, they may have suspected that they were being investigated, so they really didn't use the phone, they really didn't communicate in any way that could be um, recorded, but they would have dinner together, and they would write on napkins and pass it to each other. Um, well, this new company is going to be coming out and making a generic drug. We need to let them know this is the lowest price you can go if you want to party with us. So it truly was a cartel, and the investigations and indictments are still sort of underway. But we've heard the generic makers say, oh, well, you know, there's consolidation. That's why the prices are going up. They've We've got these mandated plant closures, so you know we need to raise the price because the um, the supply is getting smaller. But actually, there was a a drug fixing, a drug fixing cartel. Okay, so now we're going to move over to another aspect of the drug supply chain, and I'm not going to say this man's name. You know, he looks perfectly nice, and perhaps he really is, but you know, he does represent the trade organization um, that represents a part of the, the drug supply chain that some behaviors might be considered despicable. Who is he and whom does he represent? I had who up there, but you know, if you're really being grammatically correct, it's an object, so I guess you have to put who. Um, he's the president of PCMA. And PCMA is the trade organization for the PBMs. And I've gone to their forum the last few years um, to sort of understand where they're coming from. And a couple of, a couple of statements that I've heard at the PCMA forums sort of tells me where, um, how they sort of believe certain things that I don't necessarily think are true. And one, they have a, a, a fellow by the name of Dan Gilman. And he's the attorney advisor to the Federal Trade Commission. And he made the statement, transparency for PBMs is a bad thing because it softens competition and raises prices. So remember that because I'm going to show you um, something that I think it, it actually softening competition may actually lower prices in, in um, our sphere and certainly for formularies and PBMs. So who are the players? We have the drug makers. Now, since I made this, um, you know, this, this deck, a little while ago, um, pretty much the farmers, the big three pharmacy benefit managers are now all part of insurance companies. Um, there really used to be two that were separate, and I'll go through their names, so CVS, Caremark, and Express Scripts, um, but now they are now part of a larger, larger organization. So third-party payers and PBMs um, are now sort of one entity. I decided to put the prescriber and the patients as sort of crumpled up paper because really, you know, our decisions, our, our orders are now taken as suggestions, as uh, Dr. Ellen McKnight would say. Um, so we're sort of the low men on the totem pole in terms of the drug distribution system. I think we all have heard about PBMs. I remember when they first were coming in in the early 2000s and, and specialty pharmacies would come with them. Um, but they're basically started probably back in the 70s to help adjudicate claims for the Medicaid um, system. And as more and more drugs came onto the market, insurance companies found it more and more difficult to adjudicate all those claims, you know, set up formularies, decide where patients would set up pharmacy networks. So they hired companies to do that. And um, the companies very quickly could see that if they had control of the formulary and would have a contract with the manufacturer, they could make money. 
And so one of the ways they would make money early on is with spread pricing. And that's still one of the ways that they, they have their profits. But essentially they act as intermediaries between the health plans, the manufacturers, and the pharmacies. And as you hear, patients and prescribers have no place in this. And the most important thing, and that if, if you take away anything from this talk, that constructing the formulary is what gives you power. Because think about it. It doesn't matter how great your drug is that you make, particularly in the drugs that we prescribe, the specialty drugs, the expensive drugs, if it ain't on the formulary, nobody's going to take it. To be on the formulary and to be in the preferred spot on the formulary is, um, is the, the golden ring. So Express Scripts, CVS Caremark, and OptumRx. Cigna purchased Express Scripts last year, and um, CVS Caremark, you know, it's, it's sort of understandable if an insurance company buys the, the PBM, because the insurance company is supposed to be the money bags and the one with all the money. But why did they want to buy a PBM? Because PBMs print money. I mean, I'm going to tell you, they really have a way of, of, of bringing in the cash. And yet CVS Caremark was able to spend $68 billion and buy Aetna. Um, now, Caremart is the PBM part of CVS Health. They've got their pharmacies and the PBM. And um, it's actually the PBM that makes the money. It's almost as if the pharmacy is the lost leader um, for CVS Health. And then OptumRx has always been a part of United Health. United Health bought Catalyst and then sort of formed their own PBM. But these three capture nearly, now it's probably 80% of um, the market share um, in the US. One thing with this CVS Caremark Aetna, the merger actually had to go through the Department of Justice, and it took them a while to decide whether this was an antitrust, this was a vertical merger, so maybe there wouldn't be any anti-competitive behaviors. So they sort of, they gave it the, the, the thumbs up, but there is a judge in the Washington DC area by the name of Leon Richard, and he said, not so fast. You know, the AMA, the ACR, CSRO, uh, there's been a lot of comments on how this is not going to be good for the system. So he has not put his stamp of approval yet um, on the, the CVS Aetna um, merger. Again, I'm going to bring back this whole idea of competition and transparency. Is it good or bad? So they claim to dra um, bring down costs, and you know, in a way, when they set up the formularies initially, it was to help insurance companies save money. So they would set up more affordable pharmacy channels, um, increasing use of their mail order um, and specialty pharmacies. You know, I have patients that they can actually get their hydroxychloroquine cheaper at their local pharmacy than through the mail order. You know, but they tell them, well, I'm sorry, if you don't buy it through us, it's not going to count towards your deductible. So they really have been able to this mail order uh, generic price spread and utilizing their own specialty pharmacies has, is another source of profit for them. And it's not necessarily always good for the patient. Um, I put question marks after encouraging the use of generics and affordable brands. I can't go into it but very much because I don't have the time, but there was a lawsuit against um, uh, Express Scripts by a particular law firm up in Boston. And I cold called them when I read the article in, um, might have been the New York Times, and they actually picked up the phone and talked to me. And in, in talking with the partner who was instituting this, this uh, uh, lawsuit, I said, how did you find out about how the PBMs work and, and whatnot. And he said, well, he has a friend who's an endocrinologist who would always prescribe generic testosterone topical. And the patients would go to get it at the drugstore, but their insurance only covered the brand, which was much more expensive, but they really couldn't afford the generic either. So he started looking into why would a company that's supposed to be saving money for patients pick a more expensive drug? And that's what got him started on um, looking into the behaviors of pharmacy benefit managers and how they put together our formularies. But the realities are they do make money, and they make a lot of money. And Express Scripts, when it was sued for non-fiduciary care of their clients, which are the insurance companies, they very proudly stated, our fiduciary responsibility is only to our shareholders. So patients certainly are nowhere in that responsibility. 
So the formulary construction, spread pricing, particularly now in Medicaid, I have a slide later showing you the various states are showing how much money they can save if they no longer use the PBMs to adjudicate those claims and, and take in a lot of money on, on spread pricing in Medicaid. And specialty pharmacies, of course, we all know the PBMs like us to use their specialty pharmacies for the specialty drugs because the specialty pharmacies also get a percentage of the list price. So the reality is that they ultimately determine what drugs our patients take, when they can take them through step therapy. You can take this one first. No, I'm sorry, you can't have that one until you take this one. Where they pick up the drugs and how much they pay for them. Because the coinsurance that is, is a lot of times 20% is based on the list price of the drug. So they determine how much our, our patients pay. So what's at stake? Money aside, what's at stake is the doctor-patient relationship. And I think we've just gotten so used to, I mean, I've been in private practice now for 31 years in New Orleans. And, you know, and, and it's a grind. Every day you've, you've, got to, you've got to make sure you take care of your patients. You know, in my case, I have to make sure the business is running. So the things like this, we just start obeying the rules. Okay, this is a step therapy. Okay, you've got to take this. You've got to take this. And, you know, wh when do we have the time to fight against this? But as we know... You know, when you're talking to the patient, I go through the various mechanisms of action, but the most important question is what? Who's your insurance? And that's what determines what the patient can take. So we're faced with these formulary restrictions, step therapy, and it's not always bad. I'm, I'm not putting this down in general, but if you really think about the, the opportunity to use various different kinds of drugs, we are restricted. <clears throat> and the higher list prices, You'll see why that's important. It does lead to higher pa uh, patient cost sharing. So let's sort of break down the drug money services flow. And it's not quite as complicated as perhaps an immunology slide. And I've sort of made it a little bit simpler here. But it, as you can imagine, it could start getting a little bit um, confusing. So as you see, the PBMs are right there in the middle. They have proprietary contracts, meaning confidential contracts with the manufacturer, they have confidential contracts with the health plans and, again, with the pharmacies. Only they know what each of these contracts say. So the thing that I'm going to concentrate on is this relationship here, the pharmacy benefit managers and the manufacturers. So what do the PBMs get from the manufacturers? They get rebates on the drugs plus fees. And since I've been giving this talk, the rebate amount for the formulary has shrunk and the fees have gotten bigger. And the reason is because as these health plans have discovered these rebates, they're insisting the PBMs send it back. And so the PBMs had to figure out a way in order to keep a lot of that money, so they reclassify the formulary rebate as something else. So now they're very proudly saying, oh yes, we're passing the rebates back. Oh yes, we'll pass some of those back to the patient as well, but they've been reclassified as fees. And then, what do the manufacturers get in return? They get placement on the formulary. And if it looks like a kickback, it is. It's not like a kickback, it is a kickback. In the late 80s, these particular rebates, um, there's an anti-kickback statute, had safe harbor. If it wasn't a kickback, they wouldn't need safe harbor from the anti-kickback statute. And that's something that's in play right now in terms of safe harbor for Medicare beneficiaries, and I'll talk on that. So the PBMs have power. Why? Because of the, the formulary. They um, determine the copay, the coinsurance, and the, phar um, the pharmacy choice. So manufacturers have to deal with PBMs. If you notice, there's not a lot of manufacturers coming out and complaining about PBMs. And we kind of know why, because if they do, there can be payback. And no one wants to get on the wrong side of the PBM, because again, if your drug's not on the formulary, and we know exclusions every year, we get that list of exclusions. If you're excluded, no one's going to take your drug. So if they, if, if they make the right bid, preferred placement gives them exclusive positioning, Step therapy, non-medical switching is, I don't know how many of you remember, maybe about four years ago, United Healthcare um, took everyone that was on Humira 
and essentially put them on Enbrel. And how they did that, they said, we're not writing the prescriptions, doctors. You have the control. We're just not going to pay for that one anymore. Um, so essentially, they are practicing medicine um, without a license. So that year, no longer was Humira um, paid for. Everyone had to switch over to Enbrel. And you got it. The next year, there was a non-medical switch back to Humira. And that's when rheumatologists really got upset. And the ACR and CSRO, we all sort of got together. We got senators involved. And they agreed to grandfather um, whichever one was um, out of favor that year in. So step therapy. So it truly is um, important to have that preferred placement on the formulary. So what determines the preferred placement? You know, we'd like to think efficacy. You know, if there's some endpoints that are, you know, come out a little bit better than another drug. Um, safety considerations. You know, because they talk about saving money for the healthcare system, you would think it's the lowest list price that gets on the formulary. But, you know, we're going to have to guess again because it's not really these things. Obviously, they're not going to take drugs that are um, non-efficacious. And, you know, the ACR, our guidelines, if you look at them, it says this or this or this or this or this or this. There's no um, hierarchy within our guidelines. And the PBMs use that to say, well, if you think they're all the same, then we can pick whatever we want. So that, that leads us to the rebate story. And again, I can't emphasize enough about the fees. <clears throat> so rebates, you know, the first time I'd ever heard of rebates is, you know, when you go to buy something at Best Buy years ago. You know, you'd keep your, your uh, proof of purchase, and you would send it in, and you'd get $10 back. And that was your rebate. So it truly is a retroactive sum of money that's paid by the manufacturer to the PBM for every script that's filled. And ultimately, it truly is an exchange for placement on the, on the formulary. <clears throat> so how does it work? There's, I look at it as a bidding war. Um, it, it, you, you put in a bid and for the largest price concession. And this is a really important part. It's not a bid for the lowest price drug. It's a bid for the highest price concession. And it's a really important concept because what happens in competition, it can either drag the price up or down. Um, so essentially our drug utilization is based on this, it, this bid, not the doctor-patient relationship. This was my attempt at PowerPoint art. And um, I could have had them flying in, but I didn't really want to go that far. So this is, as you can see, all the different bids going into the pharmacy uh, benefit manager. I am making this more simplistic, and it probably is a little more complicated. And that's the mantra that the PBMs and everyone says, oh, our drug pricing system is so complex, so circuitous. No one can understand it. We really can't fix it because it's too complex. But here's the formula I made up. And I will tell you I made up this formula. But I've given this talk many times in front of pharma, in front of PBM people, and no one has come and said, well, that's not exactly how the formula is. There probably is a few more variables put in here. But if you think about it, the rebate is the list price, say it's $5,000, times the discount, let's say it's 50%, for every script that's filled, so the market share. So if you have a $5,000 a month drug and you, and you promise a 50% rebate, Every time the PBM fills the script, they get $2,500 back. So what are the variables that are important here? The list price, the discount, and the script. So if you're going to make a bid, if you increase any one of these, it improves your, your bid, your higher price concession. So any increase in any one of those gives you a better chance. So what's the easiest thing, you would think? You really can't control your scripts. Unless, of course, they do non-medical switching where they take and automatically deign you an entire new market share. Take it away from the other guy and give it to you by excluding them from the formulary. But barring that, you can increase your discount. Or what's the easiest thing to do? Increase your list price. So if you're in a competitive mode with another drug, you know, you raise your list price, they raise their list price, everybody raises their list price, and everybody gets a better bid. So this is the idea of competition. We always think of competition lowering prices. And sure enough, if you're building a house or a school or something like that, all things being equal, quality-wise, 
The more people bidding, everybody tries to undercut, and the lowest bid wins, <clears throat> and that, that kind of competition brings down the price. However, if you're selling your house, and we all know if they have a bidding war going on, the more people bidding, it tends to bid the price up. And in that case, competition drives up the price. So what do you think our system is? Competition raises prices. The more people bidding to get on the formulary by increasing their price concession bid increases the prices. So because the PBMs receive rebates and fees based on the percentage of the list price, is there any motivation at all to get list prices to go down? None. They speak out of two sides of their mouth. Oh yes, isn't it horrible, these high list prices? And on the other side, you know, I'm actually making a little bit more when the list price goes up. And this is the perverse incentive Scott Gottlieb, one of the perverse incentives Scott Gottlieb was talking about in our, our drug distribution system. Everyone likes the higher list price. In that whole thing there, specialty pharmacies make more, um, the administration fees based on list prices go up, um, price protection rebates are higher when they raise the price. I'm not going to get into vendors and GPOs because that's a whole nother um, aspect of this. But those price protection rebates and fees often can dwarf the formulary rebates. But the most important aspect of this is the list price affects the patient. The coinsurance is based on the list price, so every time that price goes up, the patient's coinsurance goes up as well. I put this in here, <clears throat> you don't have to read it, but basically this was an old Express Scripts contract that um, Axios.com, if you've ever read, they sort of do investigative work and, and publish things. It was an old Express Script contract um, <clears throat> with their clients, basically showing that fees that we get we are prohibited from passing them on to you. And uh, they made Axios take it down, but not before I could get a, a screenshot of this, and I continue to show it. Um, okay. We were able to get at this kind of information that it's proprietary um, when Express Scripts sued Kaleo, who made a basically a Narcan pen, um, and Kaleo sued Express Scripts back again. And why they sued each other, Express Scripts said that Kaleo was not paying them their rebates and their fees. And Kaleo sued them back because they were not given the market share they were promised. So the one thing that I want you to notice, this is the formulary rebate, and even the government gets a little bit of the, a piece of the action. Um, but at that time, the admin fee was much higher, only 14%. Of the, of the rebate would go back to the government. Now look what happened when they raised their price from 937 to 4,600. The rebate jumps from 1,600 in, uh, the year before, uh, excuse me, in the beginning of the year to 7,000, but look what happened to the fee. $130,000 in fees. So the, the, the formulary rebate was really only 5% of the price concession. And there's another chart that showed the price protection rebate. It was in the millions. So this is just an example of, first off, how high the rebates go when you raise the price, but the admin fees are out of this world. And price protection rebate, as I said, were, were in the millions. And the only reason we were able to get at this was because when two companies sue each other, attorneys can go in and actually look at contracts. Also, you think, well, how can this be legal, that they can charge this much for a fee? Well, it's not, as it turns out. And um, there's a False Claim Act lawsuit that's been going on for a few years now, but this is the most recent that I could find, was July of last year. A number of states suing um, uh, drug companies as well as um, the three big PBMs, because fees are supposed to be market value. And when you looked at those fees, those are not market value. So there are some laws against some of this egregious behavior. This again, um, if we look at 2017 or 2018 price concessions, it's probably up to $150 billion. Now this is not just rebates. You know, this includes 340B pricing, this includes, you know, some of the foundation um, donations, but uh, again, probably here, it's up to about $150 uh, billion that is paid in price concessions from manufacturers each year. 
but a chunk of that goes to the PBMs. And they call them savings. We are saving, you know, the system billions and billions of dollars every year through what we do. So where do all of those savings go? It's saving the healthcare system. Lower premiums? Anybody here 